everybody, Ben Woodruff here with another Falconer video. Uh, today's video, uh, I happen to have a friend with me, this is Max. He's a brand new macaw I've had for just a few days. He's a rescue, so you see on his chest he's been plucking some of his feathers. And uh, parrots are very social, and if they don't get all their emotional needs met, sometimes they'll damage their own, harm themselves by plucking their feathers. I do wildlife educational programs at Evermore Park in Pleasant Grove, Utah. Feel free to look it up. It's a very cool place. And he's the newest addition to my program. But I have him at home today because I want to give him some extra attention and making sure he feels socialized and part of, part of the team and to get him to help stop that plucking behavior. So he's with me today. He's a very neat macaw. He's uh, a cross between a scarlet macaw and a military macaw. It's a very interesting hybrid. So he will be with us today. What I want to talk about today is actually um, how many birds you should have as a falconer. Now, this may seem like a straightforward question. It might be, well, how many can I legally have? Or what do I want? What am I interested in? Uh, all of those things, though, there's, there's more factors that you might think about. Now, every region's different legally. Uh, here in America, there's three ranks. You start off as an apprentice and you become a general class and then a master class. And it used to be an apprentice could have one bird, general two, master three. Now that's um, gone different directions. There's different rules based off of captive bred versus birds from the wild, but still an apprentice can only have one bird. So if you're an apprentice in the United States, that decision's made for you. But after that, what do you get? Now, I want to uh, share principles. Of course, if you're an apprentice, you have a sponsor and hopefully a good falconry community that can help you uh, make some of those decisions and better assess. But I want to share principles. I know there's a lot of people on here from other parts of the world, and hopefully some of these principles I'll share will give you some uh, good, arm you with good ways to make that decision. Now, the first principle that is not always true, but that we, we always like to share, is if you have more than one bird, you won't be able to give them the same amount of attention, of attention as if you only had one bird. So there's sort of this unwritten thinking that one bird is the best number of birds to have uh, because you can focus on them and give them all the attention in the world. That's not always true, but that's a good principle of a place to start. It's important to remember there are different families of birds and there are different life situations. Uh, so the main families I'm referring to are the Budios, like red-tailed hawks, ferruginous hawks, that family. The soaring open country hawks. The occipiters, like goshawks, short-winged, long-tailed, extremely high-strung, fast hunters of the forest. And the big long wings, like large falcons, peregrine falcons, jeer falcons, things along those lines. Those are three of the main groups that falconers usually are getting involved in. If you have a red-tailed hawk, I've seen a lot of red-tails, a lot of bootios in that family. They don't want to hunt and hunt and hunt. Once they've made the effort to catch, say, a jackrabbit, they've put forth, uh, they've pushed their limit. Because remember, that's you're dealing with a family of birds that you, is used to just, I'm going to sit on a telephone pole, not expending calories, looking around. Oh, there's a gopher dive which is falling with style i got it that's what they're used to in the wild and now you are taking that bird building their muscle training them uh increasing their athleticism and now you have this red-tailed hawk that's like all right i'm really pushing the limits of what my species does bam i caught a jackrabbit that that took some work you push the envelope there and the bird's like i did it and i can feel this is a very large animal that I've caught. And if you give them a little bit of a meal, take the rabbit away and say, let's keep hunting, they might be like, I don't want to. I just wanted to eat what I caught. Where they're so confidence-based, usually, and this, again, this isn't always true. I know a lot, of, especially a lot of squirrel hawkers with red tails in the east and in the southern United States will hawk all day. But out here, I'm just telling you my personal experience, most red tails, once they've made a good catch, don't want to keep hunting. So if you're in that situation, let's say you have fields that are full of rabbits, maybe you want two red-tailed hawks. Maybe that's good. Maybe you hunt for one with an hour, catch a rabbit, put it away, go back to your truck, get the other red tail, hunt for an hour, catch another rabbit. If you have the time, if you have the prey availability, and you have the fields to fly in, why not? 
But this can change. Uh, Escipiters, like goshawks, cooper's <laughs> hawks, sharp-shinned hawks, sparrow hawks, these are birds that are much more naturally athletic than budios. And so you could have a goshawk and hunt all day. All day. Every day. Literally. You could be like, I have no job. I'm just going to take my one goshawk and hunt 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 and hunt. And they're like, yeah, next. Yeah, let's do it again. As long as you're doing your weight management right, they never stop hunting. So if you're doing that, why get another bird? There's other reasons, but that's a factor. If you really want an occipiter to fully blossom, maybe you only have one bird. Depends. But that's something to factor in is that the more you invest in that occipiter, the more athletic they're going to be. Falcons. Falcons, large falcons especially, they get out of shape so quickly. They also get back into shape so quickly. I'm amazed if I have a, a high-flying falcon that you train to circle and circle above you thousands of feet and then you flush the prey and they dive down and are chasing it. Such a bird, you take two or three days off and the next time they're like, <gasps> they're huffing and puffing and having a rough time. And the reverse is also true. You take two or three days of legitimate flights and the third or fourth day, they're like, all right, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> this is nothing. They get, <laughs> they get back into shape very quickly. Where are you hunting with your falcon? Me? I, I have to drive probably 45 minutes to get to a good flying field. So if I'm going to do that, and maybe I'm serving up uh, homing pigeons as a training process, I, if I'm going to drive that far, get out the telemetry or get out a drone for a training flight, I'm like, what, I drove 45 minutes and flew for 15? This is stupid. So having two birds, it's kind of nice. 15 minute flight, woo, now we're done. Put up the next Falcon, 15 minute flight, woo, now we're done. And oh, hey, I got one of my friends who came out with, we'll put up his or her Falcon, woo, and might as well. If you have the field and if you have the time, and you had to drive out there, that makes some degree of sense. But maybe you don't have that. Remember, falconry is primarily a fall and wintertime sport, and so you're racing daylight. If you have a day job and you're like, okay, I got off work, grab the bird, go out to my flying field, maybe you don't have the time. Maybe you should only have one bird in that case. There is a legitimate concern as well with social needs of you personally your own personal life. Uh, I know many people who get into falconry do so late in life. If you have a spouse, if you have kids, and it's like, oh, I went to work and now I'm flying my bird. Meanwhile, your spouse or your children might be like languishing at home like, where's my, where's my parent? That can be really hard. Uh, and adding birds to that should you should be taking note now i know people where that was the case and there was such social discord and problems from that that their spouse ended up joining in on falconry and now they do it together that's great uh there's also some amazing falconers uh like the colsons here in the united states who they their life they breed and fly harris hawks and they're amazing falconers and that's what they do that's that's their life that's really cool uh, I also know falconers who, uh, uh, amazing falconers like the legendary Steve Shingren, which if you haven't heard of him, please look up his YouTube channel. He's got amazing videos. One of, if not the greatest grouse hawker that's ever been. Look up his stuff. He is so dedicated. His entire winter, he's living in another state. Hunt completely dedicated to hunting grouse. That's not, oh, I'm driving out to the field with my one bird. It's like, hey, you have several legitimate game hawks and you are fully dedicated to these flights. And they're some of the greatest performing game hawks that have ever been seen because of that full commitment. It's like, during the winter, I do falconry. That is my life. Not just after work, that is my life. And it's amazing. Not everybody can do that. But that kind of level, why would you only have one bird in that situation when you have the time and the prey and the flight location to do it justice, might as well fill that time with truly remarkable game hawks. And he does. So there are so many factors to factor in. And also the bird for you, the bird you want might not be the bird for you right now in your life. Uh, maybe you're, it's like, hey, 
I want more than anything else to fly a peregrine. And maybe I have the space, maybe I have the prey nearby, but maybe I'm in college and I have a little bit of time and it's like, you know what? Maybe the best thing for you is a kestrel. Maybe a kestrel is like, hey, I'm going to go out and hawk sparrows behind dumpsters and in fields next to the school because I'm a full-time college student and I'm busy. Maybe that's better for you. And then later on in life, you're like, well, now I'm, I live out in the country and I'm going to fly peregrines. That's okay. But all of these factors matter. I'm just saying there is not one answer for everybody. Even though I started off with that principle of, hey, <laughs> even though I started off with that principle that if you have more than one bird, that they'll never, they won't all get the same time as if you only had one bird. I know that's the principle I shared, but I'm also trying to share with you that there's so many other factors. How much time do you have? What effect and impact will it have on family life, friends, job, that sort of thing? Other responsibilities. What prey availability do you have? Uh, what time of year is it? All of these things matter. But this is where having a good sponsor and a good falconry community are so helpful. If you're going into falconry or you're an apprentice falconer, talk. Get perspective from other falconers and find out in your area and your situation what works best. And there are many situations where having multiple birds works well. I'm the poster child of always uh, having too many birds, unfortunately, because I do education as well. So far too often, I find myself and I'm like, geez, if I had a few less birds, I would have more time available for training. And I see that that's the case. Because when you're trying to do falconry and hunt with these birds over here, and you have these birds that are on an education permit that you're training just to fly for programs and be social around people, that takes a lot of time. But, you know, you have to balance following your passion and what you want to do with what's realistic and balanced and honest. So I hope some of these principles will serve you well. And I hope you had enjoyed uh, having Max here. He, uh, I think he enjoys being a ham. But uh, let me know what else you would like to see down in the comments below. And if you haven't subscribed, it really helps me uh, build this channel up if you hit subscribe. And as always, happy hockey.